my previous books presented a perspective about the teaching that we call the diamond approach and its various aspects and dimensions and processes and and it's like it presents a map of reality and so people who read the books or read them they will think of a certain map reality has those dimensions has awareness and presence and love and Good qualities of personalness and the impersonal and all of that and and uh, it has a flavor of being progressive and uh, moving deeper or higher and as if there is a final end to it now which uh, my previous book the book of, I talk about the absolute truth right and I talk about the journey of ascent and descent yeah, ascent meaning go, go all the way to the absolute truth, the descent, and how to bring that back into life and the world. So it's a what I call a hierarchical view of reality, which many teachings have. Many teachings are hierarchical. They're saying this is more real than this. This is false. This is true. This new paradigm. Uh, does not participate in that whole perspective. Like the whole view that have presented itself, the whole perspective that I have presented in the books as a damn approach, is uh, taken as one particular way of seeing things. And I present another view I call, uh, that I call the view of the of totality, which sees that as one view, Advaita Vedanta is one view, Mahayana Buddhism is one view, Sufi is one view, and each one is true and accurate view of reality, but they're all different. And the view of totality is open to all of them, is open to be any of them, but doesn't have to adhere to any one of them. So that's part of the paradigm shift. It's not even a paradigm shift. It's like um, leaving all paradigms, being open to all possible paradigms. So the, the view of freedom and a different meaning of the word freedom. People usually think freedom is the freedom of consciousness, the freedom of being, uh, the pure awareness. That's freedom. The view of freedom in this book is different. It said, yes, that is one way of freedom. But there are other ways that we can be free. So freedom becomes bigger, has, uh, has more connotations. The book says that, that it's not a negation or throwing away of the progress of path. It is including it as a very effective way of working, as a good path. However, there are other ways of, there are other progressive paths, and there are other paths that are not progressive. And this view says all of them are good. And it is not, the view of totality is not exactly a path. It is a, a, an understanding, an awakening to some kind of truth about reality. That reality is free to manifest itself in many ways. And there's no end to the way it manifests itself. say it's better that the, a person follows a particular spiritual path you know and that's spelled out in the book that the one need to adhere to a particular spiritual path and not just go from one place to another which many people do which doesn't work very well it's good to really adhere to one spiritual path and practice it and be go as deep as possible and when one has it is a measure of freedom then it is okay to to branch out, sort of, and explore other possibilities. But if you explore the possibilities from the beginning, it's endless, we can get lost. Mm -hmm. 
many of them were surprised, <laughs> and some some I imagine were sort of not disappointed. It's more like a sense of uh, a loss of like I know this. Now you're telling me there's is a whole other thing. So like I mean, what I know, what I realize, is not uh, good. And I'm not saying that, I say it's good, but there are other possible ways. That's why I have dialogue with many teachers, because I understand their view, appreciate it, and I want to hear more about it. I'm going to give them my view. And I happen to have many views, not just one. It's just confusing for some people. So the view of totality, some teachings have it already in a certain way, but they usually leave it for the very, very, very advanced stages before they mention it. You know, when realization has matured and one is deep in it and you know, doesn't care about what happens, then they talk about things that way. And here I mention it here. So although in the teaching in the school, I've known it for a long time, but I didn't teach it, I waited for a long time. At some point, the feelings came that it is time for people to begin to know. But that is one thing that the book presents. But the book presents itself mostly as a, what I call the dynamic of realization. How does realization happen? Which is true about all the paths. See, in different paths, see it slightly differently, but I'm saying it is about something about reality. How does realization happen? Oh, and so the question, how does realization happen, is the question, is realization happens because of practice? Or does it happen because some other force comes in? Like uh, is consciousness chooses? realization to happen this is uh, the absolute it just appears at some point or is it because we practiced all these years because that's a big question for anybody who has any practice because everybody practicing from the perspective I'm practicing I'm inquiring or I'm asking myself questions or I'm Whatever the practice, whether it's meditation or inquiry or prayer or, you know, devotional practice of one kind or another, each individual think their practices is going to lead them someplace. So I discuss this in detail, what is true about that and what is not true. And it is, I thought I should write it because nobody wrote, written about that. Because it's... Uh, Many people are confused how it happens. Some people take it to one side, that the practice is what makes things happen. Some people say, no, the, this is a separate self, an individual does, can't make anything happen because it's an illusion. A realization happens when a being appears, wakes up to itself. And that's when realization happens. I'll go in more detail about what is the dynamic between the two. I questioned the cause and effect relationship. I said, is there a cause and effect? Can we think of it in terms of cause and effect? Or how much of it is useful to think in terms of cause and effect? How much of it is not useful to think of it in terms of cause and effect? Because the situation is more complex, more subtle than cause and effect. Because reality from the perspective of realization um, is outside of time. So cause and effect is within time. So to think of cause and effect uh, in a complete way it can't be true, however, People do notice, if they don't practice, nothing happens, right? People who practice tend to have a realization. People who aspire, who long, who have deep interest, possible for them to have realization. 
But it is not absolutely true. Sometimes somebody wakes up for no reason. You know, like Ramana Maharshi, for instance. He wasn't practicing. He was, he was young. He just woke up one day. You know, he was interested. So he had some interest. From, I remember reading, but he wasn't really he had a guru or anything like that. So that, but that's an exception. It, that, but it does happen. So I include all those situations. There are people who practice for years. They go in a cave and practice for eight, ten years, and they come out enlightened. And there are people who practice eight, ten years and nothing happens. Right? And there are people who don't practice, something happens. So what's the, what's the mystery? It's a very interesting kind of dynamic. So much of the book actually deals with that question, which is basically the question of what is the relationship between individual efforts and the grace of true nature? The grace, the blessings, or the effulgence of true nature. What's, what's the dynamic between them? Is there a relationship between them? See, from an individual perspective, people think, well, either that uh, I practice and then that can cause realization, or that I'm good and devout and then God will give me uh, blessings and uh, something good can happen. But then there's the other uh, perspective, people especially, uh, people who believe in pure consciousness or uh, uh, think it just wakes up by itself at some point. It's not as independent of the individual because the individual is an illusion. I consider all of those, and not all these are approximations. And I try to have a better approximation. I'm not saying I'm saying, necessarily saying it's absolutely true, but I'm trying to have, include all these approximations to, to get a more complete picture. So the book goes into how even when we are practicing, it is really consciousness practicing. As an individual practicing, it is pure awareness practicing. So, so, so it is truly a non-dual view. The person might not have non-dual experience, but the view is non-dual. You see, many people have non-dual realization, but they have non they have a dualistic view. You see, they, they still think, well, non-dual means conscious does it. The individual can't is an illusion, can't do anything. But that means there is an individual really, that's out of nowhere, from the perspective I'm presenting, even the individual, when, when the individual believe that they're doing something, it is actually the pure awareness that is doing it, but appearing as an individual. For me, that is more acceptable understanding, or more complete understanding. Combines both the dual and the non-dual, combines the individual and the impersonal. But the book goes in much more detail about that. Yeah, so the book does go into that, attempts to answer that question, because um, the view of totality, I call you, includes many views. It takes the non-dual view, it takes the, the dual view, it takes other views and combine them all together and create a new synthesis. So, it is awareness that wakes up, but it is also the individual that wakes up. They're both at the same time. And all the awareness, or not even its awareness, it is true nature that wakes up. And, uh, and it wakes up through an, an individual, because there is no other way for it to wake up. Yeah, so 
so there's a paradox, right? So it's a paradox, and it's not obvious when, when a non-dualist talks about why they're talking that way. So in the book, I go in some detail, exploring how can that be, because it's both true. You can say that uh, uh, true nature is always luminosity, or the, it is a pure uh, awareness and pure perception, no one. At the same time, it wakes up. So what does that mean? How could that be? You see? So many people say it's just a paradox. I go to explain the paradox. I give a view that gives make sense, make it understand, oh, it is a paradox because I'm not taking this, I'm taking just one side into consideration. If you take several sides into consideration, you realize it makes perfect sense. In fact, that is how things work. So the book, a lot of it is how things work. The perspective in the book talks about no space, the true nature beyond space and time, and true nature that includes space and time. The transcendence implied in the teaching in the book is what I call an inclusive transcendence. Does not transcend by negating. It transcends by including. So it is beyond time and space, but includes all time and space. So time and space are there. Time actually is just the way, uh, the way, uh, the truth reveals itself, the way it, it shows itself, the process by which it happens. You call that time. So the book considers many interesting questions. Many of them are mysteries and paradoxes, you see. And so I question, for instance, uh, the motive of practice. Does practice have a motive? And does practice have an end? Right? Who does the practice? Right? If nobody does it, what does the practice mean? And that's why it's called uh, runaway realization, because it's the whole idea is that. Uh, being, or I call it being in the book frequently, and it doesn't mean its existence, but being meaning in the, uh, whatever it is, that is, that reality is, it reveals itself in many ways. It reveals itself as pure awareness, it reveals itself as emptiness, it reveals itself as love, it reveals itself as the physical world, it reveals itself as non-dual, it reveals itself as dual, it reveals itself as a realization that's not neither dual nor non-dual, because not dual and non-dual are conceptual opposites. And reality doesn't have, it's free for conceptual opposite, free of concepts at all. So to say it is a dual and non-dual, I mean, this is not thinking, this is, I'm talking about experience. Like this realization I, I bring about, which when I say realizing fair, I bring examples, other kind of realization. I, I discuss several different kinds, that neither dual nor non-dual. And um, so one of these in a realization that I call it neither dual nor non-dual, it's like uh, dual means there's a separation. Non-dual means there's no separation between one thing and another. But my experience of you, am I separate from you? Am I not separate? My response is the question is irrelevant. Reality is much more interesting than separate or not separate. In fact, you, you, I can't say it's separate or not separate because that I'll be I'll have to sort of use my mind to say that. 
But that's one an example. Really, there are other examples, like the entanglement thing I talked about the other night. How reality can be seen as a unity of time and space, where all time and space can be in the palm of your hand, all of it. The book is really addressed not just to the practitioner, it's addressed to all the teachings. Each teaching, I'm asking each teaching to look at itself. Each teacher to look at their, their view and to recognize it, it is a view. It's not all of reality. So the book in that way is challenging, but challenging in a friendly way. You know, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying, you're not wrong, unless you believe that's the only way. If you believe that's the only way, well, that's the beginning of fundamentalism. That's how it begins. So how do we cut away the origin of the root of fundamentalism? How to be really free? from any position. People say, well, if I'm awareness, I'm free from any position. No, you still experience yourself as awareness. You're not free to experience yourself as something else. You see? Because I can experience something, experience myself in a way, I can't call it awareness. Awareness is another, another dimension of what I am. Freedom the freedom to be all of those, without choice, without uh, compulsion. The freedom is the freedom of being to manifest itself, whichever way it manifests itself and experience, and there is no impediment to it, no restriction, no view, or even view taken from direct experience, to say, no, it, has, it is this way. It has to go that way. So you never know what's going to happen next. You never know what's going to be the next realization. You, don't, you never know which way God is going to reveal himself next. Runaway means it's not controlled not controlled, not programmed, it's free, it's alive, dynamic. So the nature of reality is like that. So we can be free. Runaway realization is, is a life freedom. But runaway realization, I took it from metaphor, runaway train, right? Runaway train, me a train, so going on the track, there's no brakes, nothing to stop it. it. Keeps going, you know. You don't have control. Nobody has control. Nobody has control, and there is the view keep changing too. When you're in the runaway train, the view, and what you see changes. But here, the view that changes is the perspective about reality. Is it individual? Is it personal? Is it impersonal? Is it uh, dual, non-dual? It is uh, beyond dual, non-dual? Or is it even something else? The genuine teaching, the teaching that expresses reality, doesn't uh, contradict another teaching, although it, appear, it appears as it does. You know, it appears in different language, different experience, different conceptualization. Different, but the view totally shows that that doesn't mean one of them has to be wrong, or one of them is better than the other, which many teachings do. Many teachings think they got it. 
So everybody, <laughs> that's one thing that the book tried to do, and that each teaching, or trading, believe they have a monopoly on truth. That they know what the truth is, their truth is really the truth. The other teachings, they're maybe they're close by, maybe they're not. They don't really have the truth, and they actually say it. And there are debates throughout history between the various traditions, and to, all the way to wars and all of that. In this book, this presents a view that allows all of them to coexist and to exchange views and to learn from each other. To learn to be more free. It's about freedom. And freedom in ways we, we haven't yet imagined. Ways we imagined, but ways we haven't yet imagined. And to see that uh, there is much more to reality than that, that can be contained in any one teaching.